imagine the future progressive movements to study them and analyze them. In this clash of globalizations, if we to simplify your argument, we have the new constitutionalism, which seems pervasive and entrenched and really embodied in, you know, regional trade agreements, the World Trade Organization, and so forth. Um, how does one go about studying? Does one simply do an inventory of progressive movements? Or I guess my question really is, in your current program of research, um, what kind of data will you use and what constitutes evidence uh, mm -hmm. for your claims? Mm -hmm. By the way, why are you thinking about that? Um, How many more <laughs> questions do you want to ask? Me? <laughs> I have an hypothesis for why, which you didn't mention in some way, for why the term globalization first begins to appear in the 1990s. Because that's when the academic center here recommended the first creation of a program in global studies. <laughs> <laughs> well, it originated here, that's obvious. And I get that idea out, so I want to be excited. Thank you. So we want to cite you and Mark. <laughs> well, I'll make sure that in my genealogy of the term globalization, I actually do trace it to a specific point of origin. I get this Cheadle Hall right? <laughs> I was there yesterday, so I can say I've been there. Um, yeah, imagining to study, I mean, the, to be able to study effectively all of the issues and, 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 and forces that I'm talking about uh, is, is something that I couldn't do myself as such. I would do it in working with other people, and uh, the, the research project that I've, I've, um, um, I've crafted on this and indeed the, the broader research program that I mentioned, um, I think provide me with the method to answer the question. Uh, as far as evidence is concerned, there's many different aspects of evidence that we could trade statistics, an analysis of constitutional forms, changes in constitutions, the way that constitutions are modified by, uh, by, by governments entering into bilateral um, uh, investment treaties. You know, there's a range of evidence, and the evidence that would be used would depend upon um, how it was analyzed and from which perspectives. So lawyers would analyze the evidence in different ways to the way that political scientists typically would or environmental studies people would. I think the way to research this is collective, um, but it's, it's something that, that needs to have a kind of a coherent theorization. So the, the theorization that I have on uh, leadership is, is dovetails with and is connected to the theorization of this broader research program that I, that I mentioned to you. The research program has basically three components. Um, the first component is, is, is concerns governance of, of, of the global political economy. The second component concerns um, global governance and geopolitics, including post-conflict re reconstruction. And the third is, 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 is on social governance. And um, the, the, the people that have helped us to develop it, we got a grant from the um, the Ford Foundation to hold a, a workshop and we've elaborated this. And it still needs more work, but it involves people from a, a range of different disciplines, everything from genetics and medicine across to constitutional and, and labor law. And um, basically, the, the questions and the concepts are, are placed in, in the midst of, of teams. And the teams are constituted by including both very senior um, thinkers from their fields. For example, we have, we have three very senior lawyers involved. Uh, Upendra Baxi, who was the, um, who was the uh, president of, um, of the University of Delhi, which is the largest university in the world, I believe. And he litigated in Bhopal. He's a constitutional mm -hmm. expert, an expert on, on the rights of subordinated people. He's a professor at, at, uh, at, at Warwick. People of that caliber, plus mid-career and, and, and emerging scholars, and it's articulated with students because students have many interests that connect into this. Um, so you, 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 you carry out a research program which has a series of objectives, uh, and you seek to, to achieve those objectives <coughs> you know, in, in some kind of predictable way over five, seven years, however long you can, you can, you can raise the funding for it. Um, but you, you do it from the precept that, uh, that knowledge is generated collectively by cooperation amongst intellectuals, uh, and intellectuals at different stages in their intellectual formation, including students. And people are included in a constructive and creative framework. And then you might get an answer to some of these questions. Many of these movements, like uh, the, the, uh, the landless peasants movements or, or ATAC, 
are doing a lot of this work already, and they've, they've gathered enormous amounts of data. Um, you know, they, they have data on human rights violations, etc., etc., etc. So, um, so I think that um, you know the way that you study this, it, it, you know, it it has to be understood as something that goes beyond a single individual working a alone in an isolated way in a in a study. And to me, that connects to what has happened here in terms of how you you develop global studies and, this, and, and the way that, that students work. Here. So we've got to raise more money for it. Well, I, I actually made a step in that direction because I told that any student who, when I was giving my lectures, if their cell phones went off, they would be confiscated and the proceeds would be given to global studies research. <laughs> <laughs> sadly, yeah, sadly, no, <laughs> sadly, nobody's phone went off after that. Yeah, I said that, so that's a question.